So good morning, and uh, really thank you for, for inviting me here, um, because, uh, well, I've also already noticed that whenever there is a topic which is very seldom di uh, discussed among, um, among, among people, even among friends, then people usually call a storyteller, so that's why I'm here. For some reason, for storytellers, it's um, always a bit easier to, to deal and tackle with some more complex, complicated topics. And actually today I want to talk with you why at all we think that this is a complex and complicated uh, topic. And for sure, I should also say that um, for me it's also not easy to talk about it for you, because um, I don't know what experiences you've had. You know, maybe, maybe some of the people have experienced a near-to-death experience. Yeah? Or, or maybe, maybe you, you, some of, 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 of you lost uh, your, your loved ones or, or relatives. Or maybe, maybe someone never had a chance to talk about death with their parents at home. So I don't know from which background you are coming. But um, I try to find the ways uh, that, that um, are maybe more common for me when I talk about um, death. Uh, and this is through storytelling. And uh, another thing I want to say to you that please... Also, I want to ask you for, for some um, understanding that uh, I lost my voice a little bit in this uh, deep, uh, dark November, late November weather. So sometimes I'll sip from this little cup over here. And um, I'll start um, maybe in the beginning at all with uh, why at all it is easier to talk through stories and fairy tales about death. Why, why it may be easier for, for uh, children and also for the, for the ad adults you see, I believe that stories are some, some so to say, the, the containers of the soul of the people or of this land where the stories were invented. And the stories, they have come through the centuries, like through the dense filters to come to nowadays. And they are carrying this, uh, not, really, not only the tradition, but the soul, the spirit of people who created them. And of course, there are also modern storytelling and there are also modern authors who write stories nowadays. Uh, and um, you see, the way, like why you came here at all, maybe also, not only because this event is really interesting, as Marina told us today, but uh, I guess that you are interested in storytelling. I guess that some of you, if not all of you, like to listen to fairy tales sometimes, maybe, or storytelling. And you see, I think that there is a certain type of people who enjoy storytelling. And these people are children, old people, and philosophers. So think for yourself to which of the groups you think you rather belong. And um, um, so maybe without longer inter introduction, I'll just um, tell one of the stories which is uh, very, um, very important for me. It is a story that, that I really like. And this story was told to me by my very good Iranian friend. It was told to me when we were sitting around the fire uh, and when the sparks, sparks of, the, of the fire flew high in the eastern sky, it was somewhere on the distant shore in Turkey, near the sea. And uh, there were some other storytellers and friends who sometimes have this kind of special gatherings where we share some of our ideas and uh, where we talk about, about um, our stories and, and share storytelling. And then he told me this story that I want to share with you today. And let me start with some, some sound and just some listening. You just don't have to do anything, just, just enjoy the sounds.
in a very small village high in the mountains. There was this uh, idea, this beautiful idea that a man is wealthy if he has many children. So the more children he can, he can help to raise and, and raise his own children, then the more genuine, truthful, real people he can then later provide for his community. So there lived a very, a very wealthy man, an old man who had 12 children. And actually, in our terms, we would consider him poor because this man didn't have much money. So the community was supporting his children. They were given money for, for each of his children that, that he was raising. And one day, the wife of the man suddenly discovered that her belly was starting to grow bigger again. And some months later, a beautiful baby boy was born. So he was the 13th child. And when the man took the baby boy and brought him to the council of the elders of the village, they told him, we are very happy for you, but we will not be able to support your 13th child. Maybe you have to find a godfather for a child, and he will bring him up. So the man took the baby boy home, and some months later, he covered him in goat skins. He took the baby boy and also some goat milk for the journey, and he went into the mountains, on the, through the mountains road, to find a godfather for his child. And as he was walking, he suddenly saw a stranger, a figure, approaching him. And the stranger was wearing a golden gown. And when this, strange, when, when, when this man came to him, he, he, he told the old man, I know you're looking for something, and I want to be the godfather for your son. The man was really surprised, and he said, well, well, but who are you? And the stranger, wearing the golden gown, said, I am God, and if you give me your child, I will teach him to become the most genuine and truthful person, and he will be like an angel living here among people. He will help many people. And the old man, he thought for a moment, and then he said, thank you very much, but no, I think that this world is too difficult and too brutal sometimes, that uh, an, an angel can't live here in this world. I'm going to look for another godfather for my son. And he went on. So he was walking on the, this mountain road, and suddenly he sees another stranger coming to him. And this time the stranger was wearing a dark violet gown. And when the stranger came, he told the old man, I know you're looking for something. I would like to be the godfather for your child. And the man, he was also a little a bit surprised, and he said, well, but who are you? And the stranger told him, my name is Devil, and if you give me your child, I will teach him to make the difference between good and evil. And whenever he will be speaking to people, everyone will believe him, and maybe he'll become a famous politician. And the old man thought for a moment and said, no, thank you very much, but I think that politicians can't really always help the ordinary people. And he went on. So as he was walking on this mountain road, he saw another stranger coming to him. And this time, the stranger was wearing a black gown. And when the stranger came closer, he said, I know you're looking for something. And uh, I would love to be the godfather for your son. And the old man wasn't surprised already anymore. And he said, well, but who are you? And the stranger said, my name is Death. And if you give me your son, I will teach him to become the best doctor the world has ever known. And he will be able to help many ordinary people. So the old man thought for a moment and said, all right, take my boy and be a good godfather for him. And he went back home. So the death, he took this little baby boy with his goat skins and brought him gently to his kingdom. And the baby boy was growing there just like an ordinary baby boy. And he was growing quite fast and years have passed and he was getting taller and taller and he was growing into 
nice, beautiful, handsome young man. Is it enough of height, you think? Could it be a bit higher, a bit taller, no? This, yeah? Okay, I think that's enough. Okay. And uh, when he was already of age, when he could take full responsibility of him, that means he was 14. Remember, this story was told to me by an Iranian. So when he was 14 and he could take full responsibility for himself, his godfather, Death, asked him to come. And he said, well, my son, you have learned during these years many things from me. You've learned about different remedies and herbs and you know how to cure people. But now I have to tell you the most important secret. Please remember, whenever you'll be visiting a person who is sick, come to his bed and before doing anything, just look deeply into your heart and there you will always find me. I will be standing near the death, or near the, near the bed of the, of the person. And if you will see me standing in the legs of the bed, near the legs of the person, then you should know that he will get well. So give them the remedy, give them the herbs, and he will get well. But if I'll be standing near the head of the bed, near the pillows, then you should let go. Because I will come to take the person and you shouldn't give any hope to the relatives of the person. And remember, if you do the other way, if you don't listen to my word, then you will lose your own life. Did you understand? Of course, daddy, sure, that's no, no problem, of course, said the young man. And they said, they said goodbye to each other, hugged each other gently. And the young man went to the kingdom where ordinary people lived. And there he became a very famous doctor. He never made any mistakes. Whenever he said that the person will live, the person lived and, and became healthy again. And whenever he said that the person is going to die and you have to let him go, then it was always like that. And it happened one day that the king, the king of this kingdom, he fell seriously sick. And he was lying in his bed. And no wizards, no wise men, no one could help him. And then they remembered that there is this young, famous doctor, and they invited him to come to the king. And when the man came to him, the king told him, you should make me healthy. If you do, you'll become the second rich person in my kingdom. And if you don't do that, I will throw you in the dungeons forever. Well, the young man came to the bed of the king, and he looked deeply in his heart, and there, he saw his godfather death standing near the bed of the king, exactly near his head. The young man, the young man tell, said, Daddy, please, please make two steps, two steps lower, just, just two steps back to the legs. But his godfather death was standing there and just silently shook his head. The young man thought for a moment, hesitating. And then he said, the king will leave. And he gave the remedy for the king and some herbs. And the pale face of the king started to become more reddish, more, more pinkish than, than red. And then the king opened his eyes, wake, woke up, stood from the bed feeling again very healthy and well and he was so thankful for this young doctor who saved his life that he he gave to him as a present a beautiful house and when this young doctor was looking at the beautiful rooms in this house then he was so happy that that, that he will leave here and that it was a beautiful apartment and, and suddenly in one of the rooms he saw his godfather death standing there but this time, his godfather wasn't so happy at all. He was quite serious. And he's told to his son, my son, what I told you, I asked you never to do against my will, but you did the other way around. But this time, I forgive you. If you do this the next time, you will lose your life. <coughs> okay, said father. Okay, okay, said, said the young man to, to, to the father. And then some years went on, and the single, the only daughter of the king, the princess, fell seriously sick. And when she was in bed and she couldn't stand up anymore, the king invited the, the young doctor and he told him, listen, if you make my daughter healthy again, you will be the next king. You will marry her and you will be the next king. And if you don't, I will throw you in the deep dungeons forever. 
well, a young man came to the bed, and the first thing he had to do, he looked deeply into his heart. And there, he saw his godfather death standing exactly at the head of the bed, near the pillows. Mm, the young man again asked, Daddy, please, just two steps for me. Please, two steps back. <laughs> but, but the death was standing there and just shook his head like that. Mm, so young man really was hesitating a bit and then, and then he said, the princess will leave. And he gave to her some remedies, some herbs. And the pale skin of the princess became a little bit pinkish, then pink, then red, then purple, and then she died. The king was shocked, and of course he threw the young man into the dungeons. And sitting there in the dungeons, in cold with some, some mice around and, and, and with some water, the young man was really feeling miserable. And when he was nearly falling asleep, he saw his godfather death. And this time, his godfather didn't tell him anything. He just took him gently into his arms, and they flew away. They were flying over mountains and deserts and seas, and then they came to a lonely mountain. And in this mountain, there was a cave. So they went into the cave, and when young man saw this cave, he was astonished because the cave was full of candles. Some candles were big, some candles were smaller, but they were all shining. And they were walking around these this huge corridors of, of candles. And then the young man asked the, his godfather, well, where are we? What are these candles here for? And his godfather, to death, told him, you see, every person who lives now in the world has a candle in here. And if the candle of this person is, quite, is big enough, then the person will leave for quite a long time again. But if the candle is small and short, the person will die soon. And then they were walking, walking, and then they came to a candle which was nearly disappearing. It was just, just this tiny, and the light was, it was nearly lit on one of this candle. And the godfather said, death said, you see, and this is your candle. The story which is, um, yes, for, for me, it's, it's a story which is quite, quite uh, endless because we could talk hours about this story. We could, we could discuss this story for a really long time because there are so many elements and so many different interesting symbols that we could discuss. But I would like to just, at, for, for the moment, focus on one interesting aspect of this story. You see, uh, in this story, the young man had to every time look into his heart to find death. And this is an interesting thing that I think is very often forgotten in, 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 in our society and nowadays, is that we are all carrying a small little death with us, or that death is a part of our being, of our, of our existence. And I'll come to it later at the end of, at the end of my talk. Um, and for now, I just want to... Uh, bring an example from my own experience when I was living in uh, Istanbul. I did my research there and I lived in this uh, city for one year um, and uh, studying Sufi music therapy and, uh, and um, in my, eth my ethnographic research. And while I was staying there, I was surprised about how different this town was from all other places I've visited before. And there, 
there was a particular interesting mixture of chaos and order. You see, maybe you agree with me, maybe not, but generally the life in our region is quite ordinary, it's quite ordered. Well, um, there are some countries with, where the order is even, even, even stronger and <laughs> there is more order. Uh, and where the, the newspapers discuss for months and maybe, okay, not, not months, maybe for days, about that the kitten got uh, stuck in the tree or, or a moose came to the city or something else of that kind happened. And uh, these are very nice and we consider them very uh, wealthy countries to live in and wealthy towns to live in, but there is so little chaos in them that young people start to look, in, start to look for more chaos and then they start to create these kind of weird um, activities, playing with death, like, like walking on the edge of these uh, skyscrapers and, and, and jumping there and, and playing around, uh, tickling with, with some very uh, adrenaline um, things and, and activities. And um, it's interesting that in the other parts of the universe, where there is nearly no order, as we would say, and I think that where most of uh, the people from the Western, uh, Western part of the world will feel quite uncomfortable because, well, what's going on? Why are there cows everywhere? Why are they eating, eating paper? Why, why there is so much litter on the streets? They would feel this strange chaos there. And you see, Istanbul, for me, is a place where there is a perfect balance between chaos and order. You kind of you can live in the city. It's a beautiful city to live. It's just it, you know it's just um, perfect because there is it's very modern. There is a very good tra transport connection everywhere, and you can find Wi-Fi everywhere. And what, what else do you need? <laughs> but but the thing was that uh, there was always enough chaos. And uh, later, after some months, I started to get this feeling that I don't uh, that that going out of my home where I lived. I never know what will happen. I could maybe uh, arrange a meeting in three hours, but, and maybe I would never get, get to this meeting because the traffic jams will be for five hours and I would, be, I would not be able to, to, to go all these distances to, to the meeting. And there are and other, other things like traffic. You know, there is an interesting thing that in Turkish music videos, I think that every third romantic um, song which has a t music video, tells the same story, the story when a, there is a couple, a boy and a girl, and one of them dies in the car accident. Because I've never seen this amount of car accidents, and I was so surprised that nearly all of my friends had a relative or a friend who died in a car accident. So uh, the, the whole environment of the city is really insecure. And, when li and living there, I was surprised to get this feeling that I started valuing my own life and my own moments, my own free time much more. And meeting every time the person, you could really not know if it's the last one you see him or not, if you'll see him again. So I think that this particular mixture of chaos and order creates a very interesting uh, space for creativity. Well, my friends, musicians, they just, uh, some years ago, they, they went to live to a very wealthy society, to a very wealthy country. I will not name the country here, just, <laughs> just because I think it's a wonderful place to live also. But in, after one year, they just came back because they said, we couldn't play music there anymore. We couldn't create there anymore because it was just too secure. People are living just like in a dream, thinking that they will live forever. They make so long-lasting plans. They, they have so bad relations with their families and their, their, and their close ones because they think that, oh, well, I'll be able to deal with this conflict later. But maybe not. So my friends just came back because the place was too secure. I know that it's a quite difficult thing to talk about because now we can't really say that there are so secure places considering these uh, this, uh, quite terrible terrorist attacks which are happening just, just in the streets of, of, quite, of, of the cities that we considered safe and, and wealthy before. But still, there is this interesting thing that whenever there is not enough chaos, whenever there is not enough just, um, just um, natural chaos in the society, uh, then people will start to create their own. So the young people get for, go for some more adrenaline for, adrenaline for some more risky games, and, um, and which can become also very, very dangerous. And I was so surprised to discover that there are in the internet a growing amount of so-called death videos or death online. 
uh, when people are just filming the way they died uh, or, or committed a suicide. And I think this is something that really tells about the sickness of our society. As a storyteller, meeting my other colleagues, storytellers, we all always uh, discuss, discuss these things and discuss what is happening with the people to whom we are telling the stories. And we see, unfortunately, that there's a, this uh, really alarming number of young people who can't find um, something that they're looking for in life, who can't maybe find the reason to live, and then they decide to die. And I will come to this, this idea again a, bit, a little bit later. But now I'd like to tell you about one interesting experience that happened also to me when I was doing my research in South France. I was studying there um, one community. It was a community for non-violent non living, and there were generations of people living together already for 60 years. So the children of the, of the people already grew up and they stayed in this community. They didn't want to go away. It was deep in the mountains, deep in the forest, and somewhere in south, south France. And you could uh, access them just by one railroad, where the trains went, I think, once in two days, something like that. And in this place, there was no uh, mobile connection, so there was no, um, no mo mo mobile connection. There was no Wi-Fi wi and no electricity. So from some of the faces, I see that you think, this should be hell. <laughs> and some, I think, look more like, oh, but that could be a paradise for some time, <laughs> for a vacation. So there were many visitors coming to them and staying within this community, living with them, doing some work in the free air, resting from their office works and maybe getting some inspiration there. And so there were always visitors coming and going, coming and going. And there were about 40 people of different ages living there together, like families. And when I came for a couple of months, then um, I just uh, really was so surprised about this warm and, well and, warm and friendly greeting there. Because I, it, I very quickly get made friends with, with, with most of them. And, and uh, it felt to me that they were my friends from, like, from, from, from childhood. But then came the last day when I had to leave from this community. And you know what happened? In the morning, I went to tell the, there was a kind of gathering each, mo each morning, and also breakfast, and I told everybody that I'm leaving tomorrow with a morning train. And they were so, they were so happy, saying to me goodbye, and so warm. But later, when we uh, went out of the breakfast uh, area, suddenly they stopped noticing me, as if I was already dead for them. And I got this, getting this feeling that I was a ghost. They, didn't, they really looked through me, they didn't see me anymore. You see, well, I understand them, because they get so many visitors. And if you really attach yourself to someone who comes and then goes, and this happens like every day for, for years and years, this can be really, really, really difficult. So even though we, may, we were like friends there, but when I told them that I'm leaving, no one really noticed me anymore. So I had to somehow leave this day, and then, then I got some directions that I have to clean my room where I lived. It was like the very beautiful kind of hobbit kind of houses where we lived, really, really beautiful. And I had to clean everything after me. And I, I could use the warm shower because you no know, warm water was also there. Well, well, there was no electricity. You had to heat it with the, with, with the oven and get some, and get some, get some hot, hot water. So, and during this day, I got, I got getting this feeling as if I was already dead for them. I was not there anymore. And then when I, get, I went to sleep with this strange, weird feeling that no one is noticing me. And the next morning, very early, in, when it was still dark, I had to wake up and I went alone through the dark forest and mountains because it's a really remote community. And I got a really feeling that uh, as if like, I was traveling from one universe to the other. And then I was standing there at the, at the railway station waiting for the train and it didn't come. I was waiting for one hour, for another hour, and there was no train still. So I decided, well, what to do? I should come back because, <laughs> because there is really, really no, no way to go. And, and the next train will, will be the day after tomorrow. So I turned back. I went all this hike <laughs> back to the community. And when I came there, that was for me amazing because, because I, got, I was even more, well, I was, it, it, I was really, it was very clear that I was already, dead for them, because they, looking, they were looking at me as if I was a ghost. What are you doing here? How is it possible that, that, that you are here? You went away. Well, I told them that, yeah, I'm not really a ghost, it's me, I'm, I'm, I'm alive. 
And um, the thing is that the train didn't come. So they said, they, they said, yes, these things happen in France. It's so awful, you know, trains don't come. And then we decided to call the railway station to ask maybe when, if, if there will be another train. And we called the lady who was there talking on the uh, other side of the phone. And this lady just sounded so ordinary and so every day in her in every her everyday voice she just said oh yeah there's no problem you see there was just uh, a suicide on the railway so we had to cancel the, the train and this moment when i got to, through this day the feeling that as if i was already dying for them to hear something like that from the lady working in the railway some saying as if you know like um well you know like the the, the driver was late or something but no she was saying that about a person who decided to give up his life and saying that in so, such an ordinary voice was really, really shocking. Well, unfortunately, it is like that, that, that very often in our society we don't value the single life of a person. And um, this happens that uh, in, from the perspective of the state, from the perspective of the organizations, it's sometimes not as worthy as it could have been. And you see, um, just look at... I could talk for quite a long time, but I will try to, try, try to cover up now um, some of my ideas. Well, whenever we, we talk about death, I think it's uh, a sign of a healthy society when people can talk these topics, and it's a sign of a healthy family if people can talk about these topics with their, with their, with their parents and with their friends. And, um, and it's really a pity that in this part of the world we feel a little ashamed to talk about death. Either we make it in a very funny way, like, you know, joking, because whenever you laugh at something, it makes you not be afraid of it. You know, this is a very old technique that people were using. Or we are using it uh, in, another, in another way that um, it's surprising that, although we don't talk about death, but we are surrounded by death images everywhere. You know, in the media, in the internet, there's so, such a big amount of big images of dead bo bodies and unfortunately, these images come from usually the violent death, you know, war and so on. And they're really not really pe images of a peaceful death when a person is surrounded by his family. And maybe a painless death, that's, that's maybe something that a person could have want for himself. So, um, yes, I think it's uh, very uh, important to start thinking about why is it that in, in my society? And why is that that media is using so much of these kind of images? You see, whenever you uh, look for storytelling, for example, you want to find on Google something about storytelling or some books, then um, when I googled storytelling in, in, for, in Google search books, and most of the books that come up belong to the marketing or business areas. How, how you can do a good storytelling for your, for your goods or for your services. How to become a good storyteller if you want to be a good entrepreneur. There are lots of courses and, and, and books about that. But for me, the traditional storyteller, and for my colleagues from other countries, we think that it's also a little bit alarming. Because you see, a story is a very strong tool which can turn into a weapon. If it's made without consciousness, if it's, if it's made not thinking about, the, uh, what, about what it will bring later. So you see, uh, for us, the traditional storytellers, we were educated to always carry in mind the soul-centeredness of the story. So if this story that we are talking, if it's going to support a person's inner world, his soul, if it's making him, it would make him or her feel more calm and peaceful and better and at peace with himself. Or if this story is going to create more unrest, more revolutionary feelings. And unfortunately, today, most of the stories which are told to us and which we consume subconsciously are told not from a soul-centered perspective, not from the perspective of how to give more peace and more balance to a person how to make him be able to create balance in his life, not, not the unrest, not the revolution. And um, so this is something that's just, just an idea to think for you about. So, so really be careful about what kind of stories you consume and what of the storytellers you, you really trust. And think about what kind of background and maybe, maybe goals they have. But what is their goal? Is it some profit? Is it some, some fame or something? And finally, I just want to finish with the very last thing that I started saying about um, 
um, that there, these young people who decide to do suicide, they often don't have the, the meaning for life. Maybe they just don't know why they live for. And this is something that people sometimes ask me as a storyteller. So they tell me, it's like, what's the meaning of life? And I said, uh-huh, I'm going to say to you it's in two words. No, I never, ask this, no, no, I never answer this question. But I can give you, instead of an answer, I can give you a question. Just think for yourself. Uh, what, like, if you want to know what is worth living for, what is worth living for, then think about another question. What is worth dying for, personally, for you? What you could die for, what you could give your own life for? Is it your career, your business, your family? There are many, many answers, and I think each one of you can give your own answer. And um, I think this is something very interesting just when you go home, just to think about that. That every day when we wake up, so today we woke up with this beautiful topic of death, and we start the morning with this amazing topic of death, feeling maybe a bit thankful that, 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 that we are alive and don't, not knowing what will happen in two hours or, or, or in two days or in two years, you know? This is the beauty of the fragility of life. And this is, some, this is something that the storytellers always want to remind you that not, don't take the life for granted. Just uh, leave it as if it was the last day. Leave it as if, and maybe you see how your relations change, your relationships with, with your friends, with your colleagues. Maybe you'll also get more creativity because, well, maybe it's uh, the day when you can do everything you can for your business, for your career, for your family, for your loved ones. So I think here I have to finish because we're running out of time. And um, thank you really much, very much for listening to me, for listening to this uh, quite uh, interesting topic. And I wish you a good day. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Paulina. So we still have some time for, for, for questions. I just saw some sketching. It's, it's very <laughs> funny. So if you need to leave, it's okay because it's working day. So you feel free. And if you have questions, please raise your hands and we can still uh, talk here and answer. Um, okay? So do we have any, any questions or was the story very, like, I think it was very like, you start to think and maybe you are more like with your thoughts. So does anyone has a question? It always takes time to digest, yeah. <laughs> and don't worry. <laughs> no? Uh, so, actually me too, I'm now like maybe more in my thoughts and starting to <laughs> also analyze like my life and what I need to do uh, <laughs> next. So thank then, thank you, uh, thank you, Paulina, we have some small present for you. Uh, I think you're not afraid of uh, when you have death <laughs> <laughs> on your back. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you very much. Just yeah, from exactly for a storyteller. Thank you. <laughs> so, like people would see, okay, she knows something. And here is the phrase. Uh, this is this was your uh, uh, from, uh, this was a quote, right? Yeah. So it's your quote. They the company yeah. this they checked uh, you out and they found this quote. So it oh. was done by for you. <laughs> oh wow! Thank you. Death gives importance and value to our time. Well, I didn't know I I said that, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Maybe so somewhere in the story, just passing. Ah, <laughs> we have one question, right? Okay, so one question. Yeah, it takes time. <laughs> so, sorry, Emily. I, my brain needed some time to, to think. So, yeah, sure. you were talking about suicide. So, and then this question came to my mind that, because you were saying that in some countries we don't have that much suicide because it's not that much dangerous things happening there. You were, I mean, this was the thing I understood. So my question was that, don't you think suicide is a bit caused by genetical problem? Because as far as I know, the main reason of suicide is depression. And some part of depression comes from genetical, I mean, from genus. So maybe in some country, this is only a question. So probably in some countries we have this genus for depression which caused suicide. Hmm. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you very much. This is an interesting question. Uh, I just want to say that in the beginning you said that, uh, just, just, just to make it a bit more clear, um, the suicide is often um, less in the countries where life is not dangerous. It is, it is, it is more dangerous. I mean, the, in the countries where, where there is uh, like maybe not enough food, not, not enough water, where people have to really, really struggle to live their everyday life. And when people have everything they need and the, and the, and the society is very, so to say, wealthy, then there comes the, the, the depression. As for the genes, well, this is a very interesting topic. And you know, uh, in a way, I would like to look at it uh, from this, or also from the perspective of a storyteller, did people know about genes 400 years ago, like maybe 4,000 years ago? Um, the thing is that, um, of sure, uh, it is great that science is doing this, uh, is doing this research, and and there is more and more um, information that we can use to cure some diseases. But at the same time, saying that oh, this problem comes only because of genes is like taking responsibility away from you, taking the responsibility away from the society, from the um, family, uh, because uh, you know, you, could, you maybe the family, the close, the, the the friends could be more attentive to the person, and and um, and to the conditions in which the person is living. So. I personally don't really believe in this uh, genes talk. Uh, rather, I say it can be true, but look at your own contribution. Look at your own uh, contribution to this particular situation or at your friend's contribution. And, um, well, genes is, is not the scapegoat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I see so so silent. This is, this is very often after storytelling because the people really, really are in the yeah. <laughs> so enjoy this uh, interesting silence maybe or something that you get inside <laughs> and uh, keep it there longer <laughs> yes, if you can. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina.